Good evening, Rock of Ages. Thank you for being here with us uh, this evening. Thank you for being on either Facebook or YouTube. We appreciate this time that we're going to have together. And let me introduce myself before we start. My name is Orlando Noyola. My family and I have been in this in Rock of Ages or have been attending Rock of Ages for over 20 years. And I'm one of the Sunday school teachers. And uh, before I continue, I want to thank uh, Pastor Soto and ba uh, Pastor Bacchus for giving me this opportunity to share the Word of God for discipleship. On Wednesdays, or what we've called it up to this point, is uh, Wednesday, Wednesday Discipleship. And the reason we want to do this is because we want to grow together so that way we can have the same mind that Jesus and God has. Our uh, setup for tonight is, uh, is going to be like a Sunday school. I'm used to Sunday school. Uh, and so by my side, I have Omar here, and he will be looking at the chat. Whenever you write anything, a comment or a question, he will let me know, especially if it's a question that I can answer at this time as we're going through the lesson, okay? Uh, uh, what we want to do is, uh, uh, we w the goal is to learn. We want to learn and how to be better families, better Christians in our daily walk. Uh, the title for our lesson for tonight is going to be The Bible Speaks to Families. And then the first item that we're going to be looking at is Origin of the Family, that God created the family. Number two is the two became one flesh. And then uh, item number two, Responsibilities of Family, Teach Your Children, and then Recall God's Promises, and then Direction for the Family, Mutual Submission, and then Direction for Children. And so before we start our lesson, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you because we know that you're going to move, Lord, throughout your body, Lord. Lord, we know that they're meeting it, uh, through YouTube or, Lord, uh, Facebook, but we know that you are present, Lord, that you said, Lord, wherever there's two or three in your name, you will be there. Open our hearts, Lord, that we can listen with our hearts, Lord, not only listen with our hearts, but our ears as well, that we may see, Lord, what you see through your eyes. Lord, not only that, that you prepare our hearts and minds for your word that we can practice, Lord, and we can do what you ask us to do as families, as husbands and wives. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, first of all, we're going, um, you know, the family today uh, faces really big challenges. And it, it, in this generation, especially today, everybody is trying to tell us as family, Christian families, uh, they want to tell us what, a, what is a family, what is, what is it defined in? Even the federal uh, government has been involved. Even the state government and even local governments want to tell us how a family should be or should run. Uh, fortunately, Christian families have the great blessing of Scripture. We have the Bible to guide us through all of these difficulties. Sometimes we don't know. We get lost. However, the Bible is there to guide us. Scripture helps families stay focused on God's plan for them through the everyday of events of life. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at Genesis all across through the Bible. Uh, we're going to stop at Deuteronomy. Also, we're going to go through Paul's epistles. The Bible has a lot to say about families. And so tonight, we're going to do that. First of all, we're going to look at Genesis 2, that uh, it builds a solid foundation by exploring the origin of the family. How did it all start? How did it all begin? The book of Deuteronomy contains a daily prayer called the Shema, and which uh, teaches us a lot about God, what God wants, for how the uh, family should operate. What should you be doing on a daily basis? Then in Ephesians, Paul teaches us about the marriage relationship. So each of these passages highlights the dignity and value God places to marriage and child rearing. So tonight, item number one is origin of the family. God created the family. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. You know, when God created man, this is what he said, that it is not good for man to be alone. But when he did the light or he made the light, he said it was good. When he separated the water from the land, he said it was good. Not only that, when he started the vegetation, he also said, it is good. And when he created all the living creatures, he said, it is good. 
But then when he made man, he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. He said, I will make a helper suitable for him. In other words, per, a, a person that's going to help the husband or the man. You know, the first, uh, this is the first example that it does say that it was not good. Uh, the man, Adam, had not been created to be alone. Therefore, you know, and sometimes we feel lonely, even as men, even women feel lonely sometimes, and God knew that this was not good. Uh, he needed a helper, somebody that was going to be uh, with him at all times, and we usually look at this is going to be a special helper, one that will be suitable just for him. Uh, verses 19 and 20 in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, it says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, uh, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So... Adam was not like any other creature. As a result, no other, cre no other uh, created being would meet Adam's need. You would say, well, why? Well, because humanity is made in the image of God. If we look at Genesis chap um, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 say, Then God said, let us make mankind in our awe our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So people are unique. We're different than animals. And Adam needed a helper, which we've already established that. He needed someone that's going to be almost like him physically. He needed someone that was going to be uh, mentally, someone that could challenge him as well. Someone that would help him also even spiritually. God would provide by creating that helper for him. And again, if we would read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So we might wonder, what is meant by helper? You know, what, what does it mean? All of this. What place would this helper fill in Adam's life? Well, first of all, it means that Adam was going to be responsible for everything. Everything. He is ultimately responsible. He was not to give everything to his what spouse or wife. The wife was there to assist, to help throughout the daily life. Uh, she would not be taken out of his foot, so that way he would not stomp all over her, her feelings, uh, emotionally, socially, and everything. It was not for that. It was not, she was not taken uh, uh, neither from uh, his mind, so she could, he could place him in a pedestal and say, oh, she's above all women and all uh, superior beings and everybody. But Verse 21 says, well, Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And I know you've heard it before. You know, why the rib? Well, because it's close to the heart. And we, people, humanity, we need to be loved. We want to be loved. That means that he was going to love her just as she was going to love him back. And we all need love. Um, he was always going to be there with her, next to her, next to her heart. And uh, he, she was going to take or share also the same responsibilities in nurturing what? The family. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 presents the woman as a partner, not as a counterpart. Not to uh, do anything to her, but to make her, you're, we're in this together. Thus God would unite the two, the man and the woman, for life. It's forever. And he, st he stamped the institution of marriage with his divine seal of approval from the very beginning. Indeed, marriage was part of his creation and thus part of his greater plan for humanity. So we've covered so far, God created the family. He's the one that established it. He's the one that said, man cannot be alone. He said, I, we need to give him a helper. 
And it says a suitable helper. And as Christian families, we should be asking God, or men, men, if you're listening to me, we should always be praying, God, provide for me a helper, but a suitable helper, someone that's going to help me. And to what? To take on all the responsibilities. So that's item number, letter A, God created the family. Letter B, the two became one flesh. Now Adam means mankind, reflecting the fact that he was the first human being. He was the very first one. The woman is identified as Eve. If we look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Now, this identified her as the mother from which all human life would come. Everything was going to come from the woman. She's the one that provides the life. Adam and Eve were, in essence, the parents, of course, and we know of all people, everybody. Now, verse 22, Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 says, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, we see, for, we see the first family taking shape with this verse. The basic elements of a wedding are found in it. In verse 22, God presented Eve to Adam. Like a father would present the bride in a wedding, uh, this uh, speaks to the value and worth God placed on the woman. God is the one that brings us the woman. I know that sometimes as males, we want to search everywhere and everywhere. We, we go sometimes to places that we shouldn't go. But God says, you know, if we trust in him, he will provide that person for us. This verse is telling us, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. He brought her to whom? To the man. Okay, so that tells us that we need to ask God to bring us that suitable helper. In response to God's gift, Adam offered a poetic word of description. Sometimes we say, oh, well, you know, we, lie, we have fallen in love with her. We want to write all the poems. Well, this is what Adam did in the very beginning. Uh, verse 23, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 said, The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So Adam and Eve were of the same substance. That's why he called them bones and flesh. Adam saw his own likeness in the woman. He said, She is like me. She's she." Uh, it, it has the same functionality. She has the same characteristics as me. Um, this close relationship was to carry on between husbands and wives from, the time for, from that time forward. Such a relationship called for the man to separate emotionally, socio sociologically, and geographically from his parents to give his deepest commitment to his wife. That is in verse uh, 24, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. This is, and it says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. God never intended for the marriage bond to be broken. Never did. From the very beginning, he said, I will bring this helper to you, and man, you are responsible for everything. She's only there to assist and to help. Rather, husband and wife are to cleave to one another with open, loving hearts. They're going to leave their parents. He's not going to run to his parents anymore. He's going to say, okay, we're in this together. We need to start from this time on. And it's, of course, we already know it's forever. Forever. Until do us what? Part. When a man and woman receive each other in Christian marriage, the relationship should be void of shame. If we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it says, Adam and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame because they, he knew she is my suitable helper. This union has been designed by God himself from the very beginning. So item number two says the two became one flesh. He will not be running to his family anymore uh, because, oh, she's difficult or this. Well, okay, well, I mean, God gave you this one. You got to love her and you got to make it work. Of course, if this is again for what Christians, we're talking about Christians, Christians, okay? 
Item number two, responsibilities of the family. Now that you're together, now what do we do? You have to what? Letter A, teach your children. We have to teach our children once we have children. Now Deuteronomy, along uh, chapter 11, along with chapter 6, constitute what is called the Shema. Shema is uh, S-H-E-M-A. It's a great confession of faith in Judaism. What is this about? Well, even today they practice it. And uh, the Jews, what they do, they recite it twice a day. Early in the morning when they get up, right before they go to bed, they recite it again. And it's called the Shema. And we're going to read it in a few minutes. After affirming that God is the only true God, that's what really it comes down to. Let's read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, Hear, O O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you talk uh, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Thank you, Rock of Ages, for coming back. Uh, We apologize. There were some difficulties. Um, We were on Genesis uh, chapter... Let me see. I'm sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 11. uh, And we stayed on verse uh, 20. That says, Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. So these verses explain the kind of devotion parents are to show in teaching God's commands to their children. This was not to be a passive act on our part as parents. It says in verse 19 that we're supposed to teach them when we sit down with them at home. When do we sit down at home? Well, we sit down for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. We pray for our breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we also have conversations about God. When we sit down. Also, it says when you walk along the road, it's whenever you're driving somewhere, you're going to HEB, Walmart, anything like that, you tell your children how blessed we are. God has blessed us, God has, and God is one, and we believe in Him. It says when you lie down right before you go to bed, you also pray together as a family. You say, God is good. He's taking care of us. All of us went our merry way throughout the day. We went to school, to work, wherever. We're back together as a family. And God is good. And he is the one that has protected us. Also, when you get up, you pray. Pray together as well to say, God, you've given me one more day. So these are the things that we are supposed to do as parents. They were to take the lead in conveying God's truth, that we're supposed to fix all these, his words, tie them as symbols, uh, bind them on our foreheads, teach them to our children, and uh, we're supposed to write them on our door frames of our houses and our gates. I know that sometimes uh, what we're supposed, well, what we're supposed to be doing is put it in our children's bedrooms a verse a scripture verse all these I've seen a lot of uh, parents Christian families they have crosses with verses on them but sometimes I go to some houses and they have different things they have uh, um, uh, other things that shouldn't be there Uh, let's say a a game uh, something pictures of games uh, pictures of idols and all these things it's like "Mm, that's not what we're supposed to do as parents These are verb actions. We have to take action. We can't just say, well, it's because they like that. No, we're supposed to convey it. We're supposed to ingrain it in our children. Parents were called to convey the word to their children continually through speech, not only through speech, but also example. Today, Christian parents still have the sacred responsibility of teaching scriptural commands vital to Christian living. Such responsibilities must not be taken lightly, For it involves both knowing the word and diligently conveying it to the children who needs to hear it. They need to hear it. Although sometimes they say, well, I can decide or or maybe you can decide, son, who you're going to serve. No, you should have started when they were a child. So that way when they go older or get older, they will not leave that path. So that is item A, teach your children. That's our responsibility. But man... You're not supposed to do it alone. Who is supposed to do it with you? Exactly. Your spouse, your wife. Let her be. 
recall God's promises. Scripture outlines specific commands that God expects of his people. Yet, these, with, yet with these commands comes the promise of blessing for obedience. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 21 through 25 say, So that your days and the days of your children may, may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. If you carefully observe all these commands, I am giving you to follow, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to hold fast to him. Then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you. You will, be, you will dispossess nations larger and stronger than you. Every place where you set your foot will be yours. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea. No one, no one will be able to stand against you. The Lord your God, as he promised you, will put the terror and fear of you on the whole land wherever you go. God told his people that if they would know and follow his word, his blessings would continue to flow into their lives. Generation after generation. That's what God expects us to do. Yes, God wants us to find a what? A godly spouse. What, what are you supposed to do? Teach your children. And then what, what do you do? Then they, your children, will teach their children. And it goes on. It's not the responsibility of the school. It's not the responsibility of the grandparents. Oh, let's say if I send them to Bible school, maybe they'll learn. No, we're supposed to be doing it at home. We are ultimately responsible. Deuteronomy records the history of Israel as they move closer toward entering the promised land. God promised that if they remained faithful, he would give them victory over seemingly unsurmountable foes. He says he's going to, what? Bless you. And everywhere you go, when you go to your job, he's going to bless you. In the name of Jesus, you walk in and you're going to be blessed, brother. You're going to be blessed, sister. That's what God is promising to all of us. That's his promise. They would take the land in every place where their feet would tread. It doesn't matter where you go. Everything you touch would turn into gold. That's what God is saying. No one would be able to stand against you, against them. You're a godly couple and you are what stronger than anything else in the name of Jesus. Such promises apply to the church today, just like I've been saying. As God's people walk it with him, they can find victory over spiritual enemies. If you're ill, it will be dissolved. If you have needs, God will provide. God said and promised that he was. Even as they enjoy God's great provision, he's going to. I know we're going through difficult times, but God has provided. He hasn't left you alone. He's always been there because he knows that you are what? Practicing what he has left us to do. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, see, 15 says, See, I said before you today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. So you have a choice. Will it be life and prosperity because you want to follow what God says or you want to follow death and destruction? If you don't follow what his word says, that's what is in store for you. Death and destruction. And I know we don't want that, brother. I don't want it. Not even for you. Not even for the church. Either everlasting life or everlasting death awaits us. Man, once again, here we go with Adam. You are ultimately responsible. You are ultimately responsible what? To show the way. And you're going to show your children what? Life and prosperity or death and destruction. God has created the family as a central means of conveying life to the next generation. So that they may then lead their children in the way of life. Just like I said. We are to know God's commands and we are to recall God's promises. These directives hold an important place in Christian families even today. So what, is, what was item letter B? Recall God's promises. We are to teach that to our children. We are to teach them when we're sitting down, when we're waking up, when we're going to bed, when we're uh, walking with them, uh, going to all the daily uh, places that I said earlier. And we are, we're trying to tell them this is life. This is prosperity for you. You want life? It's going to go well with you. You want to prosper in your job and whatever you do? If your hands are like golden and everything you touch, that's it, follow God's word. Now, if you don't want to follow God's word, there's death. There's going to be destruction. 
So this is God's promises. These are God's promises for all of us. So now we're going to go to item number three. Direction for the family. Mutual submission. Now Paul's teachings on this passage have wrongly been used to justify the domination of one marriage partner over another based on submission. So what does this mean? Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what does that mean? Well, husband and wife, you are to submit to each other. It's not always, and I know that some people have interpreted it, and we're going to go to that verse, and it does say that. But really it's, and this is the key to marriage. I wanted to say this, actually. You want a good relationship? Husband, submit to your wife. Sometimes, don't keep, and I've heard people say, if the, if the wife is happy, then the whole house is happy. Yes, but sometimes, man, uh, man you are responsible for the decisions being made. There's sometimes that we can submit to her that she wants this or wants that. Yes, that's fine. No, it doesn't change the course. We're still looking what? At life and prosperity for this family. Okay. But if she's going to ask you to do decisions, you can submit. Because oh, that's going to lead us away from the Lord. No, no. We need to have the daily routine, daily things at church. We, at home, I'm sorry. We need to do this. We need to do that. And she needs to submit to him as well. And that's what we're reading in Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submission means that each spouse is willing to serve the other rather than exalt himself or herself. I'm just looking for myself and all my needs. And I don't want to, you know, wife, you take care of the children. I work and that's, that's not even biblical. It's he, you are responsible, man. She's there to assist, to help. And as you get home, you say, how, how did the day go? How is everything? And take over. Paul instructed wives to submit themselves to their husbands unto the Lord. Because, again, we're talking about the Christian family. Because he is responsible and he knows he is responsible for the family. Verse 22 says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And the reason she needs to submit is because he knows I have this huge responsibility. I need to, I need to look out for, um, are we serving the Lord? Are we doing what God tells us to do? Because if he's going to do things or find a job, and oh, I don't like that job. Not, that type of job in that place is not good. That's not good. Those are the decisions that you, wife, have to submit to the husband and say, you know what? Your dad is correct. Your dad is right. Verse uh, 22 is the one that we just saw. This does not mean that she is to view her husband as she views the Lord, but that she should view bringing herself under submission as service to the Lord. Submission is based on God's structure for marriage. He made the husband head over the wife as Christ is head over the church. Verses 23 and 24, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24 says, For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Because again, we already know that he is looking out for what is best for the family according to what is biblically written in the scripture. That's why she's, she will submit to her husband in everything. This speaks to the husband's responsibilities, which include that as he is a spiritual leader of the household. He is also the protector. He is also the provider. And he, she knows he's doing everything for who? For, the, for us as a family. He wants prosperity for us. And that's why he makes those type of decisions. The wife's submission does not mean inferiority. Rather, it recognizes the role of the husband. This also does not mean that one spouse does all the work of the home. That means both. I know that we were brought up. I was brought up. Man sat at the table. Mom uh, brought everything or the spouse brought everything and that's it. And, but if you can help, you should help in everything. Spouse does not, she does not do uh, everything. Here the principle of mutual submission comes in. A marriage is a partnership of two peoples who have become one flesh and are working together for the same goal. What is the goal? 
to do what God tells us to do. Verses 25 through 27, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives. Why did, it say, why did Paul say this? Paul said this because from the very beginning in Genesis, we saw that the wife was taken out of the rib, it close to the heart. So husband is supposed to love the wife. It says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as that radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. The measure of a husband's love for his wife then is selflessness. He doesn't only think about himself, he thinks about his wife and his children. Not only that, he is supposed to be listening to Christian songs, Christian movies or Christian as, as much as possible. Because that what? What does it do? It cleanses our wives. And he is supposed to bring the word of God to the house. Daily devotional, right before they go to bed, or, be, or early in the morning, in the day. That is what this verse is talking about, or these verses. Uh, the husband is uh, to be thoroughly concerned with her needs and her well-being. Are you okay? How are you doing? And she says, I don't feel good. I, I don't feel, I, 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 you know, I don't feel good. I, I, I'm, and then he's always asking, how can I help you? Uh, what can I do to make you better? The husband's love for his wife can also be compared to his love for his own body. In verses, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 through 30, it says, In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated her own body or their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Here, love for one's body is a matter of desire for health and survival. Just like you like to eat, she should eat the same thing. I know that in the past, I... I we would, we'd be, we would be shocked at families. The husband got the meat and the potatoes and everything. And the, the, the spouse would, and the children would get the rice and the beans. And so we're like, what's going on? The picture here is not correct. Just like you like what you like to eat, she should eat the same thing. And your children. Yeah, Paul um, stated a husband is to care for his wife's needs, physical needs just like he has his physical body she has a physical body take care of her physical needs also her emotional needs he has you have emotions she has emotions too how can you know what's what are you going through how can I help you also her she has spiritual needs just like you have spiritual needs so Paul restated that the, uh, the Genesis chapter 2 call for a man to leave his parents and cleave to his own wife in verses uh 31 through 33, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 through 33, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, while the video or the audio went out there was a question that somebody uh, put out so I'm going to try to answer it here in verse 31 it says 531 for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh see God instituted marriage from the very beginning family we saw that it says that the man will leave his wife to become one and the question was what you know, what if somebody else wanted to make um, the family different? Just like I had mentioned at the very beginning. Well, this is something that the husband and wife that are married right now, they know that they left their parents to come together with their wife and they become one flesh. She starts thinking like him. He starts thinking like her. And if he's leading us in the right direction, in the godly, the godly direction, guess what? We're already thinking like Jesus and God. 
And I think the question was, what about if somebody, you know, there are two males and they wanted to become a husband and a wife. What if there were two females and they wanted to become a husband? They will never, ever become one flesh. They will never think like God. Never. Because it is instituted from the very beginning. It says what a family is and what God has ordained or said that this is the way it's going to be. That's the way it should be. So they will never feel that they are one flesh. And he will always, there will always be bickering. There will always be uh, arguments. Uh, and I know that happens. I does, but not as often. And they will never become one flesh. So hopefully I've answered that question. So it says that this is a profound mystery. We cannot even explain it. Even if I wanted to explain it thoroughly, I couldn't. It's a mystery. God, what? Brought the woman to man. And he said, this is appropriate for you. It says, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Coming back to our scripture verses. Verse 33. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Marriage is an intimate, exclusive relationship in which both partners have responsibilities. And it can expect specific expressions of love in return. Each, in, in short, Ephesians chapter 5 teaches that husbands are to love their wives and wives are to respond with honor for their husbands. I believe that is most, you know, it's usually when things happen, um, they're wanting to go through a divorce. That's one of the major issues sometimes. It says, well, he does, the husband always says, she doesn't respect me. I say one thing and she always says counter to what I'm saying. I'm trying to talk to my children. She always says I'm a bad husband. I'm a bad uh, father. I'm a bad everything and, and, and vice versa. And he is always looking for that respect. So that was item mutual submission. That is, I think, godly, um, uh, you know, a message for us that this is the key to a marriage. You need to submit to each other. Letter B, and we're almost done, direction for children. The attitudes and behavior of children are important to the family as well and to God. God gave them parents to instruct them and raise them in his ways, which we've already been seeing. Even the Ten Commandments speak to this, calling children to respect and honor, honor their parents. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 say, Children, and this is good, children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. You know, this is, this verse that we just saw, you know, immediately God gives what? A promise. He says, if you honor your father and your mother, it's your, um, you know, what, what the promise is, is in verse 3, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 3 says, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So this is the promise. This is the only commandment that comes immediately with a promise. What, what, what is uh, going to go well with you? Well, because your parents are teaching you. Your parents are teaching you what? At home, how to pray. They're teaching you to give thanks to God, that there's only one God and, and, and God alone is the one that has provided for you and, and he has prospered you. And it says that he, it's going to go well with you. When they do, they are honoring God when you do honor your parents. Honoring parents was the only commandment, of course, uh, accompanied with this uh, promise. It helps establish a society that promotes long, healthy living. We often see the breakdown of families coincide with the breakdown of societies. That's why our society is all broken down. Uh, society is broken down because children are not obeying or what? Obeying or honoring their parents. Even you see that sometimes in Christian families. They don't want to honor them. However, if you do not honor them, there's no promise that it would go well with you. Keep that in mind, children. Paul also instructed fathers regarding the children. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In carrying out their parental responsibilities, they must refrain from being too strict, which can cause unnecessary anger and resentment in the child. And, and then what's going to happen sometimes tragic 
tragedy happens. In some cases, even physical or emotional damage happens to the children. Um, fathers are to model righteousness and godliness. And so even times of discipline must be marked by love. You love them. You respect your children. And an attitude of servanthood, not unlike that seen among spouses. In this way, fathers can do their best to train children up to love and serve the Lord. So our lesson ended with direction for children. And it says that if the children obey, then there are what? There's a promise. So here's our entire lesson that the Bible speaks to families. Uh, reiterating or closing is that God instituted the family. It started with him. He said, these are the responsibilities that you are supposed to do with your family. Teach them the Shema and tell them that there's only one God. Tell them that they are blessed. And if they follow what God tells them to do, they will be blessed. And then the direction for the family, that there should be mutual submission of husband and wife. And that the children should obey their children. And that the parents should not be too harsh on the children. As you teach them, guide them, love them, respect them. And they will provide the same respect back. And that concludes our lesson for today. I know that there were probably some questions that I didn't get to. And I don't, uh, but we're going to try to get back to them. Omar, my assistant here, he was going to set them aside so I can respond to them. And I appreciate you watching us this, uh, this evening and keeping with me. Um, we're going to uh, pray before we dismiss. And we're going to uh, pray about, you know, the family plan. That if we are not doing these things, that God can help us and guide us. And that God can what? Institute it and start it in us right now, starting from this day on. Not only that, we're going to pray for the offering. Uh, also for your needs. If there's needs at your house, any type of needs. You know, it might be financial needs. It might be emotional needs. It might be even an illness. We're going to pray uh, for them at this time. So let's go. Before we dismiss, uh, we, uh, we have some questions. We have some questions before we dismiss, and Omar is going to ask uh, the questions. Yes, this is from Sister Mara. Are parents held responsible when we are judged by God? I think she's asking when we pass or if we're okay. raptured and then once we get to the gates. From the very beginning in Genesis, God said that we are responsible. Man is responsible for all the responsibilities that God has ordained to him. He is to... Um, to uh, guide the, the wife into his way, in God's way, his, the children as well. And when you go to heaven, God is going to call us on that. He, he is, and uh, Paul has written and said that we are responsible. Ultimately, we are responsible for our children to guide them in that direction. Now, sometimes, I know this happens sometimes, we guide them from the very, you know, they were very small, but they, we, they left, they left. Right? And they decided to do things on their own. And that was something that they decided. But we are still held responsible to do those things that we are obligated to do. Uh, we cannot change their minds. Uh, I mean, I know that sometimes as parents we wish we could, but we can't. But we just pray and we continue to pray that God will change their minds. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor Bacchus also kind of touched on that answer of a lot of parents have wayward children. What steps should they take to see their children restored to the Lord and their family? Okay, and usually we do have wayward children, and we, the best thing to do is just keep on praying, brothers and sisters. Just keep on praying for them, and, and then, you know, kind of guide them and tell them, you know, when you were young, you know, these are the things that we would do, and, you know, we went to church, you know, you know, uh, Always go to church. Never forget God because God is the only... The reason you're blessed right now is because God has blessed us. So we keep on reminding them and reminding them. How long do we keep on reminding them? Until we die. Until the last breath on earth, that's when we can't say anything anymore. But not only that, brother and sister, because they will what see who you were. Your, your, your uh, legacy will be left and your legacy will talk louder than whatever you, you, you said, the way you lived your life, what you did, what you said. So always keep on praying. And even if we die or pass away, God will always remind them of the things that have always happened. Because if you trained him since he was small, 
he will eventually come to the Lord. We pray that he will. Okay, and our last uh, question for the night is uh, Sister Maricela. Is there a time frame that man or woman should marry? What if one has a 30-year-old living at home or he or she does not want to marry? Uh, I, can, I can answer that one okay. uh, if you'd like. Uh, Sister Maricela, if you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Just wait a little bit so that way she can get there. <laughs> okay, uh, this is uh, Paul. He's talking uh, to one of the churches. He says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. So he's kind of just telling you that uh, this is like his advice. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Okay, and this is verse 8. Now to the unmarried and to the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. This is verse 9. What if, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So if you feel that you are attracted to someone that you feel that they should marry, then you should marry. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't really give us a time frame of like, oh, uh, 30, 35. He doesn't really, uh, Paul doesn't really give us some uh, a time, time frame. frame. It's, it's just whenever you feel that you want to get married, then go ahead and do so. And when they do get married, that's good, right? Because it is good. God has established it. But if they're not married, that means they have more time to what? To work for the Lord so if they don't marry that's good sister or brother that's fine and if they don't marry yet then they should be if they're Christians of course they should be able to what to work more for the Lord spend more time at church what can I do how can I help uh, maybe starting you know uh, uh, prayer meetings starting something to work with the Lord so that was a good answer you had time to look it up very good and I guess, uh, is there another question? or that was? Uh, no, that's all the questions that we had. So. Okay. So thank you very much for tuning in. We apologize for the technicalities. I don't know what was going on. But we appreciate you standing by and coming back and every time. And now we will conclude uh, with this uh, video. I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you next time. Thank you. God bless you all.